Then you got other guys in beautiful white shirts with a red cross. They are the guys that run around up there picking up the guys that didn't pay attention what was happening. And usually it was in a severe case of some kind. And nobody liked to see blood flying down the flight deck. <clears throat> On a rare occasion, you would see a flight deck officer that was a flight surgeon up there in the island structure, which would run out there when they had a severe case. In the jet Navy, you had to have some way to start the jets. The prop Navy, you had a battery cart, went out and cranked it up, or they started up on batteries. In the jet age, you had a, what they call a starting jet. It was a miniature jet engine on a tractor that they could pull up alongside the jet, and they used the hot air coming from that jet engine off the tractor to blast it into start the jet through a air starter. Prior to that, they had a shotgun shell that they would put in a breech. When they fired it off, it would give enough gas to crank the jet engine, and there was a lot of drawback. It would put a lot of uh, mineral sod and everything else into the engine, and it worked havoc on the rotor blades. So you've got those carts running around up there. You've got a few prop aircraft that are still up there that need the battery carts. And the battery carts are now on a yellow piece of tractor, and they're powerful enough to give ground power supply to any of the aircraft up there so that we didn't have to run the engine while the maintenance guys wanted to test everything. So you got these vehicles running all over. You've got people running all over. You've got aircraft moving all over. And you've got blast from the prop and the jets. So now you, my personal experience, I think I spoke earlier about getting blown off the flight deck and we're up there at night inspecting the boundary air, layer air and there was a miscalculation between the plane director of the yellow shirt and the movement of the aircraft and us two maintenance chiefs up there trying to do the inspection so we could get the airplane to fold the wings up and get it out on the side. The director moved the aircraft and swung it around while we were still inspecting it. The jet blast from the aircraft, since he throttled up, was like 150 miles an hour. Mac caught the blast got turned around, went down the entire tra uh, catapult track, going like this, trying to stop himself, and he wore his fingers down to the quick, and he had all bloody hands from trying to stop himself before he hit the island structure. He also took about an inch of hide off his rump, and that was his first time at night on the flight deck. And I was trying to prevent that. I was on the starboard side, so when they blasted me, I went over, I missed the catwalk, and I dropped 16 feet down into what used to be an old gun tub down there where they had five inch weapons. And this was on the USS Coral Sea. I landed on my back and my head. I, I was bleeding from a number of places and I had broke the L3 in my back. 
I laid there for about seven hours. Nobody knew that I was up there until they had Mac in sick bay taping him up and he got coherent enough to tell him and ask him where Ski. And he says, Ski was up there with me. But about that time was when I woke up and I was freezing my butt off, even though we were only 50 miles off the coast of San Diego. And there was a hatch there with dogs on it. And it had a nice wrench there. So I crawled over to it, I got the wrench off, and I started banging. I couldn't get enough pressure to turn the dogs, and I started banging on the, the hatch. Because I knew they had gone past flight quarters, it was down, everything was quiet. It was like three o'clock in the morning. So I'm banging away, and it just so happened my CO's compartment was on the other side of that hatch. So he raised holy hell about who was out there banging on that thing, and they sent a, a watch down there to look, and they found me. So they put me in a harness that night, wrapped me all up, and immediately went back to flight quarters and flew me to the beach. I was in that harness for about six weeks, and I had to find out who my friends were because I could not move my arms down and I could barely walk. And after a while, they took the harness off of me and I got crutches. And after I got, I didn't want to miss the cruise, so I got well real fast and went back to the squadron because I was the maintenance chief and that was a good billet. Another time on the flight deck, I stepped outside of the island structure and they had an A-4, which we call scooters because that was the smallest attack aircraft that could carry a good bomb load. And it was small. I stepped out, that plane was all anchored down with chain and was not turning, it was not manned. So I threaded my way out, it's at night time now, and I threaded my way out to check all my maintenance guys and we started to turn the aircraft up for the next launch. So I worked my way back to the island structure and I knew the scooter wasn't going when I went out there and I didn't pay attention to it. You can't hear anything. And I turned right in front of the tailpipe and my helmet and my goggle went way out and then snapped back and almost gave me a bloody nose. <laughs> that plane was turning it and I didn't know it. So I had my head up my butt instead of paying attention where I was going. So that taught me a, a real lesson. We have to look at the, the average age of the guy that's a plane captain in the Navy. He's somewhere between 17 and 19, maybe 20 years old. And during that time frame, he hasn't fully developed and he thinks he's Superman and he can do anything. And they are usually the ones that get hurt the worst and have the accidents. It's not the guys that have been up there and made a cruise, except when some disaster happens, like they have a plane crash or something, or they snap a cable and the cable, if it snaps on the port side, it will whip around 700, 800 feet and it'll chop legs off of anybody that's out there. They showed everybody pictures of six legs flying in the air. And I never saw anybody get their legs chopped off, but I did see a cable that snapped while I was up there 
and I was protected because I was behind the planes watching them land. But the two directors that were out along the foul line had to jump in the air and let the cable fly by them. Now it goes by like 150 miles an hour, so it will shear off wings on an airplane and everything else and do a lot of damage. It only happens once in a million shots, so you never know when the previous landing, the tail hook might have hit that particular cable and put a dent or chip in it. In between the recoveries, these two guys have to run out there and inspect the cable as it's run back in to try to catch where it might have hit to see if it might have been damaged. If it was, it has to stop the landing and they have to change the cable. Or they'll drop that cable and disconnect it, pull it aside. And you still have four more cables up there. You have six wires normally. Everybody aims for the three wire when they're landing. They have a wonderful set of approach lights that will indicate whether they are running high in relation to the angle of the aircraft and where they are in the landing pattern. If they can see a strip of green lights coming across, they know that they are perfect. Their angle of attack indicator will indicate the angle of the aircraft, and if the angle of the aircraft on the approach on the guideline is correct, a green light will pop out from the landing gear and shine, and the landing signal officer will know that he's got them on the right glide path. If a yellow light or an upper yellow light pops on, then he knows that he's either too high or too low. If he's too low, he's going to hit the round down. If he's too high, he's going to miss the wires, boulder, and have to make another. And that screws up the pattern because you now lost another minute and a half before you can take another airplane on. So all of this is continuous operation, landing, taking off, an hour and 45 minutes before the launch, about 30 to 45 seconds between each aircraft landing, and about 45 seconds between an airplane being shot off by one of the catapults. The later aircraft, which are all nuclear care aircraft, the previous ones were all fossil burners. They run on oil. They have stack gas. Stack gas, when you turn in to the wind, blows away from the back of the ship, but the pilots hit that burble. So they're like this, try to stay on the guide and get down. When they have finished the launch, the ship turns around and runs with the wind, and guess where all the stack gas is? It's all floating down on the flight deck from the island structure where the gas comes out. That gags you, burns your eyes, even though you've got goggles on and everything, and it makes it a little rough to watch where you're going and what you're going to step on or what you're going to trip over.